Hello, everyone. All right, let's start. How's everybody doing? Wow, that was weak. How's everybody doing? <laughs> there you go. That's, that's, that's what we like. All right. Hello, everyone. We are Rotu, and hopefully we're going to get to show you guys some very inspiring, very exciting stuff. I'm too passionate for this engine. And I have my two favorite human beings here that I'm going to let them uh, speak in a second with all the goodies. But I'm just going to give you guys a couple stuff. But let's start with our little reel. The process of working with Rotu is different as it needs to be uh, than any other group that I've worked with. The most amazing thing to me, and I've been involved with some pretty major productions, but to see them respond so quickly, not the next day, but while I'm sitting there, but they're showing our characters being manipulated in a terrain that they're changing on the fly. Yeah, it's a whole new game. It, it's been an incredible journey, and we've, I feel like, have only just begun. So when I got the idea for Midnight Jaunt, I thought this was a great way to challenge them in the terms of creating this content. Um, you know, I hate to say it's things that haven't been done before, but we were actually doing things that hadn't been done before, integrating miniatures into our background. Um, There's been some video calls aware that have transpired between creatives and Rotu and us. Whoever the creative is will say, it would be nice if it was like, you know, we had some pink flowers here, and then boom, there's pink flowers there on the same video call. I love working with LED screens and virtual production. And uh, recently I got to work with a music video for Haley Reinhardt. And uh, they're really terrific and uh, move so quickly and just variables that we kept coming up with. And uh, it was a great experience. For me, there were two moments that happened really spoke to how profound Rotu is and what they do. So the, one of the first meetings was, here's the idea and here's a few Photoshop illustrations from a while ago. A few days later, those set pieces, those illustrations, were turned into, specifically in this case, alien worlds. And it was mind blowing because it's within Unreal Engine and I'm watching on my screen for the first time. And we've been sitting on this project for a while. And then the second meeting was now when they took the creatures, they had rigged it and animated it, not as just a walk cycle, it recognized its environment. They made it AI. They just wanted to show us what it is they need to do to help us tell the story. That was incredible. And th those two moments for me are a game changer in terms of my hope and expectation on future projects. If it's not with Rotu, then everyone else is gonna have to live up to the benchmark that they've established. So. Working in real time, opening up a lot of possibilities. So we understand the power of seeing your ideas come to life for the first time and how it can rally a team around a project. We extract and execute early creative visions, turning them into real time worlds that can be a source of inspirations, especially during the early phases of a project when the script isn't even final yet. Our dynamic creative collaboration process can help the entire production identify the precise budgets and artistic deliverables needed to get the job done. When we first engaged with Row 2 uh, for a virtual production project, you know, I'm used to the visual effects world. I was thinking, all right, in like two weeks, they'll get back to us with maybe a, a gray box comp. And literally the next day, we had a pretty good version of the first project that we were gonna do. I mean, I could have shot it that day. Their ability to iterate so quickly is just incredible. And, and for us, you know, the whole thing with virtual production is to try to be as efficient as possible, and they make that efficiency 10x. All right. Once again, hello everybody. So hopefully today's session will give you why we work fast and how we streamline in, in one master project. 
we're, I hope it's too obvious, we're too passionate for this engine and we're too passionate for the visuals. So one of the reason what we do is we try to keep some of the gray boxing to ourselves and I wanna show you in today's session the project called Coalescence, what we did. I wish I have so many stuff to show you guys that I would go, you know, five hours and so geeky. I cannot, unfortunately, they, my clock is ticking 44 for this. So I'm gonna do best I can because they have amazing stuff to show you, I'm jealous, but let's go. So I'm gonna actually start to show you guys uh, something in Coalescence. So, uh, a year ago, Neville Page reached out to us, uh, his new vision. And this film is in the era of World War I. The challenge is how do you start with, uh, in a pitch film, even in almost a, a no budget. So that's one of the things that in this room we're kind of uh, facing it sometimes. The virtual production doesn't have to be in, in a gigantic, uh, budgetary, a big budget a movie production. I think this project, and hopefully at the end of the session, gonna inspire you that I would love each of you to find a way that I think a lot of you can do it, can sketch up. This engine, one of the, I think I always finding it, every time we push, it remarkably rewards us. And one of the biggest, 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 biggest uh, thing that we're trying to do, how we can make the things super photorealistic in the beginning. Because as you know, the DPs and the director's language, what you see and what you get. Can we get that in a couple of days? Can we go in a Zoom? Whatever you wanna sketch your ideas, can we able to inspire you? Our main goal in this company, to inspire you. At the end of our Zoom call, at the end of our session, if you go home, if you're not able to sleeping, you're just pumped and feeling like a kid, that's how you want you to feel. That's how we all should feel. That's how we're feeling every single day. So I wanna run a one clip on what we did with this project. I'm gonna give you a little overview how we get in a minute and a half the little teaser that you guys are gonna see, and then I'm gonna let these gentlemen show you some of the pipelines that we've been building it. That's good, right? All right, that's it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> shout out to one and only Mark uh, Poletti, everybody. So, thank you. All right, so how did we get here? Um, we shot this at Orbital Virtual Studios. These guys are incredible. Please check, this, uh, check them online. They have a lot of different methods that do and get able to get this quality in a, such a rapid and fast in a um, 1.5 pixel pitch um, screens at their uh, facility. 
But I'm going to talk about um, how did we start this pitch film from Neville's initial uh, mind to get to all this stage quickly. Everything started, obviously, with just a simple blocking. This was super fun. I got received a couple blocking with his cardboard, basically, which it's, it's super fun, you guys can see, almost like a UE in mannequins. And this kind of helped me understand what, where we going, what's the actors gonna be uh, standing. Then at the end of, um, at the end of the two days, he actually sent me a ZBrush blocking, which is giving me kind of where the LED wall gonna be, and at the same time, where the heights and then the scales. Next. What we did here is a very interesting. Usually, as a concept artist, we would just receive concepts. We did hear something different. I got inspired from his, what he wanted to do, and he let me exactly do however I wanted to inspire him. The first image you see, it was my first sketch in the two days. So that is from the engine. What happens is, this is the shows how rapid and fast we can work this in engine. So we're online on a Zoom call. That image inspired him to go and start the, creating his props. So from that moment on, um, we, after we scanning some of the uh, props, but then we also adjusted uh, some of our trenches and environments. The next slides, this is a fun one. Um, I wish I would get into so much details. But we start the, um, scanning some of the soldiers for an environment design. Also, shout out to my CTO. He's yeah. one of the dead soldiers. You may not recognize me. Here you go. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's on there. Also, like check that. This is also another thing that's blowing my mind. You have this whole ecosystem that it just you know, every single day that we're enjoying, you have the scanning capabilities, you have the reality scan, you have the, um, the bridge with the mega scans. So that shows that, you know, I able to took a 2,000 pictures around uh, Mark and uh, Mike, then put in a reality capture. It took, a, you know, an hour and two hours to stitch in everything together. And then we just comped. That's, you know, there's no path tracing or anything. What you see, what you get from the lumen. That again, it gives you, when you go in a Zoom with the creatives and producers and directors, now you start speaking their language because then you start getting the concept, the lighting, the mood, and how it's gonna be. Maybe they have one specific idea, but now they have everything because you have the whole environment that you can start the scouting with them. And scouting can be even more inspirational with this way. Well, next, this, uh, the last image basically was we said, okay, this is where we wanna land in, now we should build the stage based on the last image. Then we're at the Orbital Virtual Studios. So on the left, uh, you can see the process of the, so the physical stage, uh, physical set starts on the left, and where the bunker do door is, uh, the LED wall. And in the last image, um, I think they did a fantastic job to stitch seamlessly the physical set between the digital set. So why we work faster and, and how we're able to iterate quickly, I wanna give my technical director to give into all the details about all the blueprint systems. Thank you, Amir. Uh, so my name is Michael Hogue, I'm a CTO of Rotu. And my team of technical artists um, help to drive uh, realism and also speed up the workflows of our art team. So I want to talk about um, what do we do internally before we meet with the clients to really speed up that, that workflow. We've sort of uh, got a reputation for not only the realism, but how fast we work. So I want to give you some practical tips how uh, you may um, also speed up your own workflows. Um, but first I want to talk about um, realism in general. Um, you may think that the key to a realistic environment comes from having photo real assets. That helps, but it's actually not the trick. Um, I'll give you a practical example we probably all have experienced. I can take my iPhone out to my lawn and I can take a glorious 8K resolution photo of my grass, right? And I can fix it in Photoshop so it tiles in both directions. What happens when I take that one grass texture and stick it on a terrain material, right? It suddenly looks like a Minecraft level. Why? Because the one daffodil in the corner <laughs> now creates a grid pattern in both directions. And so the enemy of realism is that tiling. And so I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about how we get rid of these repeating patterns 
because the human brain is really good at picking out things that uh, have patterns to them. And in fact, we even sort of invent patterns where they don't exist in sometimes. And so we've been through a bunch of different studios. We've seen a lot of different content. And some of the scenes look amazing and they look real. And some look like video games, right? And the key difference that I think I've recognized between a video game looking level and a real level is that you see some of that same asset over and over again. So for the walls that we have, we could have turned that over to Charlie and say, hey, man, can you put this in ZBrush and then Substance and do all those things to make a perfect replica of this wall? And he would have done a great job at that. But if I put five of those walls together in a row, it's not going to look real. Um, so, so yeah, the, the key is not photorealism. It's, it's actually getting rid of these tiling sections. And I think if anybody has seen the epic demo, the new PCG levels, right? Those look amazing, they look very natural and real, and it's because they're starting to develop more tools for us to create those kind of random interactions. Um, that is the, the real key to driving, um, driving the realism. So what's important, and uh, an important part of our workflow is not to jump straight to the art. Most of us started out as modelers, right? We get very excited to learn Maya or 3ds Max or whatever program. Um, and we want to put our assets straight into scenes. Uh, the problem is, um, for us, to get rid of all those little variants, like the art team would have to create multiple different variations of certain key hero assets, and that takes a very long time. So what I would like to kind of impress on you is like, don't fall in love with a hero asset put your love into a hero system that is flexible. And I'll, and I'll demonstrate that here in a session. But I mentioned um, technical artists. If you don't know what that is, uh, I'll give you some clues as to uh, who on your team might be the technical artist. Um, if you are the weakest guy on your team with ZBrush or Substance, and you're the only guy on the team that doesn't have an art station <laughs> account somewhere, you're probably the uh, tech artist. Uh, if uh, your level designers look at your assets and go, these would be great for block out, then you're probably the tech artist. <laughs> And if they say, How do, I don't know the angle of this wall, and if you're the guy that goes, oh, it's the art tangent of the wall, depth of the wall, how you're definitely a tech artist if you're the only guy that knows how to do trigonometry uh, in, your, in your class. So I want to bring up, uh, let's take a look here in the trenches at one of the key assets. Um, let's look at these wall sections, for example. If I grab this section of wall and I open up this blueprint, and go to my viewport. What's the very first thing that you notice on this wall? Well, all of the boards, and I know it's a little dark, I'm sorry, but uh, you'll see the same knots on every single board, right? And this is uh, part of that repeating tiling pattern that we want to get rid of. So um, uh, some, uh, your math nerd on your team is going to think, well, I can take some of those boards and I can flip the plank around backwards to get the detail on the back of the board. And in fact, I can get even more detail if the board is not a plank, but it's actually square. So we found some mega scan assets, and they might have been posts or planks, but what we did is we stretched the dimensions using the Internet Editor tools to make the board square so that not do I have just two sides, but I can rotate 90 degrees and I can present four different sides of that board, right? I can also take each board on a random Boolean and flip them this way so my knots are opposite. Now each of my boards gives me eight different variations. And if I can find three or four boards out of the Megascan pack, now I've got 30 some options, which means that any two boards next to each other have about a 3% chance of being you know, somewhat identical. And then we can do some more tricks. Um, I can have a random uh, chance to remove a board and show the mud wall behind it. So one of the things that I did was, uh, I kind of hide back through here. You'll see a sort of a muddy plane that's sort of a concave shape. So if I remove a board, I actually see dirt. Um, that's a great way to drive the randomness. And then as a final tip, uh, I can mess with the material properties. So. Not only do I see knots in the board, but tonally, each of the boards is the exact same color, contrast, brightness. And if I can apply some randomness to that, all I got to do is slap one decal 
over top of all that mess, and every board and every uh, wall section will look completely different and look a lot more real. So let's take, uh, let's take my trench out here. I'll drop it where we can see it. Let's put it out here. And I'll lift it up a little bit, doop, 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 so we can get a little better sense of what's going on. I'm going to turn on my snap grid because I made sure to make the board of these sections where I can grab it and quickly spam out multiple copies, and they all click together. Boom, 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 like so. And so all these walls look the same, but uh, I gave my art team an easy button. So this little randomized button, which you'll see, <laughs> is by you click through those variations of this. Mm -hmm. And not only am I randomizing the boards and the wires and the ladders, you'll notice the top I've got the sandbag walls, randomizing those as well. So um, the two things that we do uh, quite often uh, that help us, speed us up when, when we get into dealing with a client is having an asset that is randomizable, but also sort of pre-guessing all the things that we don't know. You may notice that the, the root of this system is not at the base of the wall, it's out here in the center. And that's because it probably came from a conversation where I said, hey, Amir, how wide is this trench? And Amir probably went. <laughs> and I said, great, uh, well, can you ask the director? And the director would be like, well, traditionally, the trenches are wide enough for a donkey cart of ammunition to be up. Like, uh, does anyone know how wide a donkey is? Like, so <laughs> to, to combat that, uh, what I do is I set these assets up so that they can be easily mirrored and rotated. So if I take, and my mouse is being a little crazy here, but I'm gonna rotate this sucker around like this. And for anything that you don't have a good handle on, it's a great opportunity to create a parameter for it. So here the trench is like two meters wide, but if I want, if we get onto a call with a creative and he says, hey, can you widen that trench? And I can just hit a slider and automatically make the trench wider or change the pitch on the walls or adjust it so I don't have firing platforms on both sides because that means you're firing back at your own friendly troops. <laughs> Here, I'll take a, let's get rid of the platform on this side. Um, these are all things that seem like magic when you're live on a call with a, with a creative and they say, oh, I, I like what you did, but I wish. The more you can guess those things, the more it's going to seem like what you're doing is actually um, something truly, truly special. Um, a couple other features before I move on. Um, terrain sculpting. So when we dig the trench in, in this terrain, everything's great when you're doing a straight shot down the grid of the terrain, but if you've ever carved terrain on a 45, right, you get the jaggies on it. So we've also put enough sandbags on the top and enough mud along the bottom to hide uh, the train. So those are um, other little tips that we do to make sure that our assets can be used in, in multiple, multiple ways. So in essence, um, you want to parameterize anything you don't have a good handle on. Um, that helps when you're live with the client. And you want to randomize uh, everything else. Now, one important thing about randomization is you might think, well, I'm going to slap that into a construction script, right? Uh, the problem is every time I open up this map, that wall is going to look a little bit different. And with virtual production, you have to be very careful because you may have to come back and reshoot a scene and you want to make sure that those walls are exactly the same. So a little handy tip, and I think most people would know how to do this, but uh, I'm going to show it here, is uh, I've created a custom event. Here's my randomize. And over here, I clicked on call an editor. If you've never seen this before, the effect of that is when you're back on the map, down here you get the button with the name of that custom event. So it's a quick, dirty little trip tick uh, to have functions that can be uh, buttonized, basically, when your art team finally gets a hold of it. So <laughs> that's how we handle that. And like I said before, PCG was uh, sort of available. This is kind of the old style way that we did it. Um, we have many square miles of trenches, but I've only built all of that trench out of only four boards, right? So if I take a little bit closer look at what we're doing here, like I have a small array of uh, 
the planks that I can choose from. So here's my plank types, for example. And again, uh, I might have started with a Megascan asset that looks like this. It's a vertical post. It's too long and it's oriented the wrong way. The pivot's at the bottom. But using the Internet Editor tools, I can quickly get to a plank that works for me as a tech guy where the pivot's dead center. Now I can roll the board and I can flip the board. And um, when I have multiple boards the same dimension, I can interchange them. So that's um, sort of the process of finding good assets. Then, um, like here, I'm using a lot of random floats and things to figure out the dimensions. And then I mentioned the material assets as well. So here you can see I'm actually changing the roughness specular, the tint, uh, the saturation, the contrast. Little changes in those things go a really long way, actually, even if you have identical assets and they're just totally off a little bit, um, help to drive uh, the realism. And then finally, the last thing that I do is uh, I slap a decal over top. And again, it's probably a little dark to see, but um, over top of the texture that you got is a little bit more mud. You can sort of see along the top edge, the decals actually stretched uh, along the board, but uh, from a distance with everything else going on, you don't notice that as much. So hopefully that's uh, some good tips uh, as far as um, how to speed up the art flow before the artists actually even take over. Have your tech guys sort of think through the math of how the walls are put together. Um, in the next section, we're gonna talk about our workflow of actually working live with a client. So I'm gonna introduce uh, Charles Logan uh, to bring us up for the last part of our, our talk. Thank you very much. That was amazing. I don't know how I'm gonna to top that. But. <laughs> so my name is Charles Logan. I'm the head of visual development at Rota Entertainment. And in about two hours, I'm gonna be an uncle for the first time. My sister-in-law yeah! is, sister -in is in labor. So I'm waiting for a phone call. Uh, so I'm super excited today. So um, one of the best things that Michael has showed us today that you know, Rotu can create all these amazing tools within the, all within the ecosystem of Epic. And we use a lot of tools like what, uh, how Amir talked about, such as reality capture and using photogrammetry for all these tools. So Epic has provided an incredible uh, ecosystem for us to work with. Well, one of the other things is that it kind of pushes everything out of the tradition. So traditional scouting, you know, we would have to, just like in the beginning of the slides, we looked at a lot of the, you know, maquettes and all the hand-built stuff, and then we start to move into, all right, maybe it's a ZBrush sculpt that we just kind of do a rendering key shot. And so a lot of the traditional scouting methods are right now going out of the way, right? Because now we are going into the world of real-time development. Now this is where everything can change at a moment's notice. And during these talks, then things are starting to change because in the beginning, we, we used to have to do dailies, right? We would have to go take a look at the daily renders. All right, that happens at the end of the day. But we don't have that time anymore. We have to talk, jump on a call with the VFX supervisor or the director or client, whatever you have be. And on the call, repeatedly, we start to change things. So, all right, this wall needs to be, just like Mike showcased, this wall could need, could, needs to be changing and all of that stuff and with different materials. And so at that point, now we are changing everything to be a lot more on the moment. So in a situation like that, using the wonderful filmmaking tools that Epic provides us, we have a little camera here that we don't have right now. Let me create one. So we're gonna create a cine camera actor. We're gonna drag that in. And one of the great things is that you can right click and pilot. Ooh, all right. So at this point of our you know, conversation, now that the client probably has some storyboards or some ideas in their minds, and we can take a look at the screen on the, on the right-hand si side here, you're gonna be able to take a look at all these different types of film back settings and lens settings. So these are all film accurate and standardized to what they might actually be shooting with. If your exposure settings in the post-process is set to automatic, not manual, uh, you, you'll be able to you work with the aperture settings and it will adapt to that. So for example, over here, let's switch from 
uh, universal zoom to uh, prime lens, which is about 30 millimeters prime. And over here, maybe we can start to change some lights and everything. In this level, we're using a skylight. The skylight is using an HDRI map that we've utilized. So that is giving us a very nice overcast light. And using the control L, we can start to move around our directional light to, ooh, get some very nice dark light. So we can start to play around with a little bit more live scouting like this and working with their camera angles in their minds. So around here, maybe the director says, oh, this is too dark. How about bringing in some fire? Ooh, this is already, if you're, this is one of the presets that we have, right? But this is, this is a time where we can start to explore, all right, what kind of mood and lighting we're starting to approach this with. And then you start to pop in your lights, and then we start to think, all right, this is the virtual scouting, right? Maybe this is the set over here. Ignore all the decals because <laughs> we have a lot of those sprites. But we, over here, we start to take a look at the temperature. The temperature goes dark, right? So now you have something a little bit more, all right, maybe now I get an idea of what that set could look like with different lighting setups. And using the in-editor tools, we can still go back, come out of there, and maybe we are thinking of, all right, this is a great spot for us to place a bookmark. So if I hit Control-1, this places a bookmark. So when I go back around the level, and if I'm looking around, if I press 1, I will always go back there. And let's say we're looking around the more, and we have a couple other angles that we have found. Like over here, this is a distant area from where we have been, which was over there. But right now, this part showcases some of the amazing procedural tools that the team has created. For example, an area like this has been used in the short where you saw some of the post VFX that we have helped with. We worked with great compositors, and we managed to work with them and provide them with movie render queue passes where they took our renders and started to utilize it in composite stage. And for that, we've utilized different color formats like ACES and give them, give them proper flat colors so they can use the color correcting and grading. So Unreal Engine provided us with insane amount of control over what we can deliver from pre-production, into production, and post-production. So the line between the visualization and pre-visualization and post-visualization is becoming much more blurred today. And this is one of the amazing tool sets that we have been working with. And you know, so for a little more showcase around here, you can kind of take a look at some of the soldiers that we've scanned earlier. This is, <laughs> this is Mark. Thank you, Mark, for your, <laughs> for your <Sure>. body. <laughs> Again, Mark, thank you. <laughs> so, but we have been utilizing all these tools that we've uh, captured using e Epic's ecosystem and make sure that the clients can see, you know what? This system is probably all you need in the future. You will not need your, your, your previous toolkits and DCCs. And now you can rely a little bit more on this real-time production tool that has not been possible before for us. And with that, the, the creators are becoming much more inspired. They can make much more uh, drastic decisions at the heap of the moment. So we are taking a look at a revolutionary tool set that Epic has provided us. And with that, we can create a lot more immersive content that we can work with them. So with that, I'm going to hand this back to Amir, and we can kind of showcase the next reel, if possible. So we'll give it a clap for Carolyn. And you. Before you run that, um, I just want to point out something. You know. One of the things, again, I talked in the beginning, is the inspiration is our goal from the beginning. We like to work with, we try to make it our life simple and your life simple, and make creatives and directors and producers, storytellers' lives simple. One of the things that I love about these guys, like, uh, there's a, this happening a couple times in a, in a call, even with clients. Sometimes we actually guess. Maybe we hear in a couple days earlier what they're kind of looking for, being able to sketch in quickly. We're going on a Zoom call. Nobody's expecting anything. In the middle of a Zoom call, suddenly the screen share comes. The environment that exactly what they would wish, and suddenly, wait a minute, what am I looking at it? And suddenly saying, well, that's the environment you were hoping to shoot. Wait, how do you have it? When did you make it? So that kind of the power you started seeing, suddenly you see their eyes light up, you see the, the inspiration coming, that's, you know, 
one of the things I love about just bringing these creatives inner child, because that's how we feel every single day. Ultimately, the storytelling is that. So this workflow and this whole ecosystem is giving that to us. And another example, we like to work with one master project. And this master project should serve all the way to the beginning to all the way to the end. Even though when we're done, all those renders that you guys saw, it's not a path tracer, it's just straight out of Lumen and render, which is again, it's blowing my mind and how much um, gives us that realism in certain scenarios. So in some cases, you know, we're dealing with um, different directors and different generations that we're trying to make things simplify. We're working with the gaming engine. What if we're able to pack this and making a simple UI, can able to send this to a director? I will, our job to make them fail in a digital environment as much as they can, so then they don't fail in a, a real scenario. But also, I'm creative, I know myself, and, I, and many other creatives. We like to change our minds 50 million times and the whole decisions. We're like, we have one idea. If you're showing me another idea, I get inspired, then I want this idea. If we're able to eliminate that later, if we're able to do that in the beginning, let them give them the tools, so let them play with it. We're creating the sandbox, the creating their ideas. Let them play with all these things. Then once they're done, we can able to get those changes, then the streamline. So now that we have the master project, so now we can go to pre-production. What I'm talking about is actually before the pre-production, which is the real-time conceptualizing phase that we call it. Create this uh, for the storytellers. It's a sandbox experience, basically. And that can go to production, which is goes to LED walls, or, or if you're not shooting in LED walls, that's still the same rules apply. If you're going to shoot in a real location, if, I, if we're able to give you that power to predict what is going to happen in your production later, then still the same rules apply. And then the same project goes to post-production because we can able to render and passes and hand it over to VFX Studios and they can finish the comps. With that being said, we're gonna show you a little sneak peek some of the projects that we're working on, some of the projects that um, is upcoming. Let's just watch. All right.